Good morning. Good morning. I want to sincerely thank you all for coming. And my goodness, it's good to see all of you. Good to see Jerry Merklinger back. We're the Church of the Limping Soldiers. Jerry's back. Charlotte's back with foot, foot surgery. Cindy's due with foot surgery December 16th. Uh, and many of us are dealing with things like plantar fasciitis and things beyond that. But good to be back. And uh, Glenn, thank you for playing. John, thank you for the tech help. And Jean, our head usher, Bill, and all of you who talked this morning. Do you have an announcement? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, and you see on the back and, and on the back of your bulletins, there are a lot of important announcements. Tomorrow is a major tomorrow evening is a major church board meeting. That is to prepare for the fall forum, which is coming up. Uh, probably within a week or two after that, we'll have another board meeting to raise concerns, hopes, and dreams, more of a thinking and sharing time. But tomorrow is more of a business evening. Two, and then Tuesday evening is our last Bible study, which will be a Bible study and not a guest visitation by many others. Remember, the memorial service for Ira Ginder is Saturday, November 5th at the Moeller Church. And following the service, there'll be a time of vi for visitation in the fellowship hall. Technically, Ira and Anna are still members here, but they're attending there, and uh, I'm very happy that Carl Brubaker is going to do his service, and Carl is no longer there at Moeller. They're actually having a trial sermon this morning to, to see what comes next in their life. Please, please read everything very carefully on the back of your bulletin because there are questions I'll be asked all this week, <laughs> such as what's Jerry Merklinger's address? And uh, it's right here. Uh, any other Announcements, yes. Alexa. I am looking for guest puppets. So if you want to be in our puppet shows, come and see me because I'm looking for people. And I'm going to tell you, um, it's a lot more fun than you think. Alexis would like guest puppeteers. She will work with you, and you can pick it out a few weeks in advance and practice the text, and they tease me. I sit on a stool up here. They kneel. They think that's so funny. Instead of kneeling, I sit on a stool and raise my hand, but whatever. You can, you can sit however you want, and we will tailor uh, the puppet show to you. I know Dennis Trossel's been dying to do a puppet show. Oh, Dennis, he always says no to everything I say. Dennis, we would listen. If you and Maria would do a puppet show, we would hold our breath. But, um, and I, I'm telling you, it is, it is a joy. It's not everyone's thing to do or to hear. It is a part of using our gifts. And you can say things to a puppet that often it doesn't come out as well otherwise. So thank you. And Alexis, thank you for all that you and Kate will do. It's very important for all of us to use our gifts. I hear no other announcements, and time is quickly moving on, Glenn will share our prelude.
at you, Glenn, and I did want to share this morning. Cindy Schuler was scheduled to preach this morning. She took fairly ill this week and it also has somewhat lost her voice. Cindy, if you're listening, listening, rest up and God bless you. Brett is in Memphis and I was scheduled to be away. So, uh, you will, I, this morning I'll be sharing on some of the purpose and power of prayer in our lives. Let's turn to hymn number 601, Standing on the Promise. <laughs> Pray 
Amen. I appreciate it this morning. I was in the kitchen and folks were laughing. And I said, I know. This is, I'm not being slow here. We don't come here and have enough laughs. We've known each other for how long? And things get so serious and so worrisome. To address this years ago, when I took more risks, I wrote a sermon, The Gospel According to Bart Simpson. I put that little nut job on the front of the bulletin, and every man leaned forward and loved it. Because I'm going to say, from this show, Bart's often in church, criticizing the preacher, the service, prayer, asking the questions we all ask. And um, I always thought, uh, but I always thought, and if it was just Bender, I'd do it in a heartbeat. And he asked, like every other church person, he asked him all the deep questions. And then I've often said to myself, if there was only women here, I would, I would have a message for women. The gospel according to Phyllis Diller. <laughs> because she raised all kinds of issues. You cannot mix men and women on those topics. It just doesn't work. But um, even that got a small smile, because some, some of the stuff, and uh, when Homer Simpson got in a terrible pickle and went to pray and pray and pray and promised the Lord all these things uh, because he wasn't doing his homework, he was going to plunk out, and all of that stuff, we all have been there. So, and I say with a little humor, because humor... Um, a good laugh is as valuable as a good cry, as, not, as long as it's not at the expense of each other. And even in my prayer, I reminded us this morning, in a small church, it's easy to turn on each other rather than just to love each other and say, here we are. We are what we are. And we are here for God's love. So, for our prayer concerns, um, Remember, Do uh, Dolores is here, getting better every day. And Doris, I saw her this past week, seems to be coming along. She's having a lot of pain right now. She goes to the doctors on Wednesday. So. Has a lot of pain right now. Now, when I got up, I, I stopped in and enough. She got up and walked to the door. But oh, her yeah. was quite small. I will say that. But um, So it's up and down. Reedy Joe seems to be coming along slowly. Yeah. And I thank God for that. I thank God for that. Uh, the human knee is a funny thing, man. That's all I say. Jerry Berklinger is back. Are you wearing a boot? No. No, no boot. Should you be wearing a boot? <laughs> no. Don't ask questions. Don't ask. <laughs> Every police officer I ever met, they leaned over to me and said, Steve, don't ask unnecessary questions. I'm serious. Let it go. Interesting. Uh, and you're trained for that reason. I don't want to dismiss Puerto Rico and Florida and their rebuilding. And what can words even say to Puerto Rico, who was destroyed five years ago and was re-destroyed this year? Uh, uh, what can words even say except God have mercy and, and have your will in helping in rebuilding? Joys and prayer concerns? Yes, BJ. Today is Jean's birthday. Jean oh. is finally 40? <laughs> hey, let's sing happy birthday to Jean and someone leave me out because I don't want to get us in some funky pitch. <laughs> Control the mic. <laughs> Thanks for that. Anyway, another thing is this month. I think we're forgetting a little bit, but this month is Pastor Appreciation Month, and I think we are blessed with uh, Steve being here. And I think we all need to give him a big hand. How about? It? <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you and consider it a privilege to be here. And I genuinely mean that. And we, we all need to hear, love, and bless each other. I'm not talking about a hippie love. I'm, I'm talking about being the church in Christ. Um, any joys? Okay, Brenda. And both of his daughters sit here smiling. Clarence Martin. Granddaughter. Yeah, daughter, granddaughter. Okay. They're smiling. Um, cards, visits, care. Uh, and how he, looking, uh, I was saying to him, and appreciate like the Confederate soldier's prayer. And they, Clarence was all in. He was a model for a passionate faith in Christ um, in, in your 90s. I give him that. And, and we all are very different. But Clarence determined to come here and take the best and leave the rest, of, <laughs> leave the rest beside him. Do you know what I mean? And good for him and good for you when you do that. You're here to have your soul filled. Uh, and, and I praise God. Anything else? Yes. Please. My daughter Amy's been going through a lot with her lupus. Uh, she's been getting a lot of tests, MRIs. Please remember Amy this morning. Uh, she does have more, she's had a lot of tests and there's more to go through. And as all of us know, and as happened to uh, Cindy Shula this week, you're just riding high and, and in a moment's notice, your health seems to change drastically. And, uh, and we're all, most all of us are in that age and we're quite aware. So we lean on God and his healing grace. Yes, Ron, and then see him. Philly's one last song. The Philly's one last song. <laughs> and have the Eagles lost yet this year? No. And you said miracles don't happen. <laughs> oh, you know what? If they win, we should load up Betty's van and march down to the party <laughs> in, in Philly. Uh, that just blows my mind. See him. I have a prayer request for my husband, Charles, as wisdom as to whether or not he should seek a second opinion about a medical problem he's having. And I encourage everyone to lift up Charles. It's a wonderful heart and a heart for this church and his family. And he is going through physical struggles that just seem to be having an onslaught. That's Charles Cook. Remember Charles. And he did and and can say, today you are your own medical consultant. You may see a doctor and they say, eh, it's nothing. I've had friends that have done that over colon scans in their early 50s and died thereafter. So you have to know today when we get a second scan. And and Carl and Charles really needs that. Sometimes needs a push, I bet. And uh, remember Steele. And, yes, BJ. We saw Kim Porter last night, and she was saying that Shannon White, the friend of her daughter Lauren's, is in Switzerland. She's actually not going to make it. She's so very sick. They, the doctor said she'll, she won't live. So Kim asked for prayers for the family. And refresh my memory, would she, Shannon, be around 40-ish? Yeah, yeah. That Shannon White, a friend of Kim Porter's daughter who was traveling, and you know, essentially, this happens for a number of reasons. Your your lungs kind of gum up, fill up with glue. Is is that kind of a, yeah? That's pretty much yeah. And, and you're done. The lungs are so fragile, and uh, they take in everything, everything that's around us gets filtered through that. And we don't know. But Shannon White is dying in Switzerland. She's 40-ish. And for her and the family, it puts all of our worries into concern, doesn't it? 
that she's in her last days and far away from loved ones. Anyone else? Yes. My niece, my niece and mother-in-law requested prayer for her about three weeks ago. Her name is Jaja. Jaja. She's 81 years old. She's losing weight and losing weight. And they say there's nothing wrong with her. They've done all x-rays and tests and everything. So they put her comatose so that she quit fighting and they think maybe she'd be able to build her stuff up. Remember her. Edie has a, a friend's relative later in years who keeps losing weight, if you didn't hear, and they say there's nothing wrong with her, but they put her in an induced coma. Uh, and we'll, we'll pray for this dear, dear soul. I said to Betty, all of our life we worry about our weight. Then one day we start losing weight and can't stop. And you know what that means. Uh, uh, life is a funny and delicate thing, isn't it? Very delicate. Okay. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, it is real. We have skin in the game. And we have joys. And we have real concerns. We're going to turn to prayer song uh, 98. Be still and know. <clears throat> And I hope someone here knows this. <laughs>
kind of insisted that we let Cindy preach her sermon that she's worked so hard on, when is, it, when is too old? So today I'm going to talk about the prayer of faith from one of the most popular passages to the Church of the Brethren, page 1175 in your pew Bible. James chapter 5, verse 13. We can almost say it together from memory. Almost. James chapter 5, verse 13. So James is writing to a group of believers in difficult times. And he concludes his letter and will we'll read the last part of this last chapter. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. <clears throat> Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. <clears throat> Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, as one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back. Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. <clears throat> How to pray about our problems. James uses the word prayer seven times in this passage. And James had a reputation for being a pastor of prayer, and a man of prayer. His nickname, his nickname was Camel Knees, kneeling so much in hard surfaces that his knees were enlarged and deformed. We talk a fair amount about prayer, we study about prayer, and to be able to pray is a privilege. It is human to struggle with our prayer life. James says, and James addresses this, when should we pray? And first of all, he says, pray when you suffer physically. The word sick here means a serious illness. Without strength, unable to work. It's the same word that was used to describe Lazarus in the days before he died. It also describes the man at the pool of the Bethsaida, who sat there for long years, waiting for the waters to stir by an angel of God, that he could get in and be healed. Be, be healed. Scriptures clearly teach that when we are seriously ill, we have the privilege to call upon the leaders of the church, and to have them anoint you and pray over you for healing. There's a lot of teaching going on today about healing with a wide spectrum of ideas. I just remind us with healing, the mark of a true prophet or teacher is that their words come true. So if someone comes to you and promises healing, then it better come true. Or it's not from God. And I often share how people in effort would come to me and say, hey, your one leg is, you know, a millimeter shorter than the other. 
I can heal it. And I would always say, Brittany, let's make both legs about six inches longer. I would believe it. You know that? I get a little smart and sarcastic when you hear this stuff that I think dishonors God. God's more than a millimeter, isn't he? I mean, if, if, if God wants to make you tall or short or whatever, he can do it. Scriptures teach about three kinds of sickness. And boy, in our church, we certainly have fit. The first one is sickness unto death. It's described in 1 John 5 and in John chapter 11. God uses sickness, generally speaking, to take us home to serve Him in heaven. There are some sicknesses that we will never recover from. And typically, the human beings today, in much later years, that's pneumonia. And this is because God doesn't want us to age and turn into vegetables that languish alone for a decade. This kind of sickness, sickness unto death, is the beginning of our healing of the life that is fully life. And it is our hope this very moment. So, there is a sickness, a decline, a loss of health, for the purpose of going home to your ultimate fulfillment. Because that's how human beings make their exit. Scriptures also talk about sickness for spiritual discipline or opening our eyes. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Here the believers were having love feasts very commonly. They were having potluck suppers and mixed with worship. And they began to use it as a selfish meal rather than a community sharing. They were mistreating each other and those who bought the best fruit food were eating it up and some actually came and went home hungry. And uh, and, and so Paul, this is in the communion passage, the greater story. And Paul says, you know, and some of you are sick and in terrible health who are being so cruel to your wider church family, even at potluck and worship experiences. When we sin, it can bring sickness into our life. Uh, now, that's, listen to that statement. There are those who say, when you sin, you will always get sick. And we look at the great leaders of the, the great evil people of history who lived on great lives, and you know that's not true. It's, it's the getting quick and dirty in your theology saying, if you sin, you know, your, your, your legs will fail. No. The mystery is some people don't sin, and their health fails. Moving on. But sometimes God disciplines us because we're being disrupted to the fellowship of the church. You and I, thank God, we do not have ultimate discernment on this. I can't say, well, that person's sick because of this and that. That's none of my business. <laughs> my hands are full <laughs> making sure my heart is clean and my motivations are right and encouraging each other with love and whatever bits of wisdom God gives me. But this kind of sickness is God's loving outreach to help save our lives and the lives of others who are getting off in ruts. There's another kind of sickness in Scripture. This kind of sickness is when you're not living in sin, but it's sickness for the glory of God. Ask Joni Erickson Todd. She does an injury. This is sickness that God has allowed to enter your life because he wants to either heal you of it or enlarge your heart in faith to an extent that that witness heals others. And it is a testimony to both a believing and unbelieving world. 
In John chapter 11, a man came to Jesus who was both blind and sick. And the disciples said to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, who sinned? He's got a double whammy. Was it he or his parents? And Jesus said, Come on, guys. Nobody sinned. This is a sickness to show the glory of God. Then Jesus healed the man of both, and he, this man spent the rest of his days giving God the glory, and God was glorified in all that saw that. So we are clearly told, folks, pray about your illnesses and concerns. In this passage, we are also told, pray when you are hurting emotionally. And boy, that covers all of us. James says, is any of you in trouble? Or any of your hearts stirred and pulled down? Pray. The Greek word means if any of you are under stress, to suffer misfortune, to have hardships, pray to God. I remember, uh, I think it had to be 20, 30 years ago, when someone asked, when someone asked Hillary Clinton, when her husband was misbehaving, uh, did she have a stress test uh, uh, to fit her for, for public service? She said, my life is a stress test. <laughs> I got a kick of that. And I'm not picking her or her husband. I appreciated that moment of honesty uh, when our family members do what they do. <clears throat> this is emotional stress caused by our circumstances. And this is the question you and I are asking each other this very day. How can I live and do the best for God and the best for this country at midterms without being all miserable and worked up all the time? And you know what I mean. And I balance. Do I, do I leave the world and live in the kingdom of God? No. The kingdom of God is in uh, is in this world. And I ultimately can't separate the two. But I must balance them. <clears throat> David said in Psalm 18, In my distress I call unto the Lord. And in James said in verse 12, just before this passage, Above all friends, do not swear. He meant take un unchristian oaths to prove, uh, to prove that you're not lying. But also I say, uh, do not make all kinds of crazy statements when we're hurting emotionally. Uh, because that is when we are tempted to say big statements that are just fluff. And I, you know, someone once said, we, when, when the pressure comes on, we have two choices, prayer or swear. <laughs> and being honest, <laughs> we all laugh. Sometimes they're not far apart. Sometimes it's where that, oh, brother, I need to pray. And at least, sometimes when that comes out, it's a sign. I need to pray. And this kind of prayer is meant for an emotional belief. And I hope to all of you, when you pray, Jesus said, for the serious prayer, don't go out and sit around here. You go into a prayer closet, a private place, and pour it all out to God. And I, I fully believe that you should come out of prayer. Oh, oh, thank you, God, for giving me some healing. It is so dangerous for all of us to let our hurting emotions build and pressurize in our spirits. And you all know it's creating such a violent society around us. You know, young people who kill both of their parents because they're unhappy as a teenager. What's with that? Teenage years were not perfect for any of us, but it's letting it build out of control. Something else scripture say. Now we turn to something more positive. Also, God asks you and I to pray when we're happy. How beautiful. Meaning, some people only share their misery with God. They think of God and they think of their misery. No wonder your devotions are hard. 
Praise is used 550 times in scriptures. If you want the secret of a happy and rich experience with God, sing your favorite song of praise to God. When I say sing, I mean read it. Read psalms of praise to God and remember, be careful with psalms because psalms are the ultimate book of depression. If you're not depressed, do not read the psalms of depression. You don't, you don't need to feed that. Meaningful devotion or so much more than sharing all your grievances with God and how bad the world is. He knows about that. If, you're, if your devotions are all the negative, um, no wonder you will loathe them. Over the years, you know, as a hobby, I got it from my father, I like to build things. And they get into projects that are way beyond me. And so sometimes I stop and say, I'm at a turning point, Lord. Uh, but let's make a deal here. If I can finish this and it turns out good, help me never to boast that that was easy. Do you hear what I'm saying? And that changes stuff. I, I barely get it done and take pleasure in the satisfaction of building something. But then someone comes and says, man, that was good. Uh, uh, Lord, I promise you I'm going to say, well, that was nothing. That was easy. Because I almost gave up. I don't know if you can connect with this at all, but when that's your hobby between God and I, just say, um, some things I built, like that little white car, people say, what was that like? And I would say, that was brutal. <laughs> that was like being in Nam in a concentration camp. I never had anything fight me every <laughs> step of the way. So, what I'm saying, so, thank God I remember one time I restored a motorcycle. It was a, a, a Suzuki 250. And when I stored it, a tool flew and cut me. And it was all done. And it was show, show, show quality. And a man came and offered me what I want. I was just putting the little chain board on, and another tool went off and cut me in the face. I thought, good Lord, that stupid thing cut me every step of the way. I just thought it was so ironic, uh, and now it's gone. But just to point out, thank God, because if not, I can make everything, we can make everything about us, and God has helped you and I so many times and in so many ways, and later we think, I must be good. And really, God is intervening in all of your hobbies and in all of your creativity. We have to say today, uh, I want to say, pray when you're hurting physically, emotionally, and when you're happy and riding high to keep everything in a balance. But finally, we have to talk about one more thing. We have to talk, what does the Bible say about physical healing, which Jesus promised? Now, not so much anymore, because the world is holding the church accountable. But 20 years ago, you would have a faith healer come to town and hold sensational meetings uh, and have a flamboyant, flamboyant leader who shouts at the crowd, slaps everyone on the head. It's a charged emotional atmosphere. And then they leave. And in that night, people say, I'm healed. Now notice what Jesus does about the process of healing. I just want to point out Jesus does the exact opposite. He would take people away from the ground, talk with them about their real issues, and forbid them to run back to the crowd and say, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm better than you. Jesus never manipulates you or me to use us for a show. That's all I'm saying. I don't know who's healed and who isn't. But I know that Jesus will not manipulate us to make a human being look good. Jesus cared about their real and unique needs uh, more than impressing the crowds. Remember, and this is one of the most astonishing things we're gonna, you may take home today. Just because something seems like a miracle doesn't mean it's from God. Remember uh, Moses and the plagues of Egypt 
Just because something is done in the name of the Lord, and it works, doesn't mean it's from God. I'll give you an example. The uh, Pharaoh's sorcerers and witches could do the first nine miracles in Egypt, the first nine plagues. They could reproduce it. The only thing they couldn't do was send a death angel upon the wicked in the land. And that's haunting me. Everything you, someone can promise you in the name of God, pretty much this world, unbelievers can duplicate in some way. There's the kingdom of light, there's the kingdom of darkness. Both have their powers. So Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, about the flamboyant healers, and sometimes they heal. Jesus said, now many are going to come to me at the judgment and say, Lord, didn't I do miracles and healings in your name? And Jesus is going to say, well, hey, I never even knew you. You were doing your thing. Yet there are other sources of power. Anyway, just to keep things in perspective, one other approach to healing, and healing is important to me, and it's important to you, and it's important to everyone who's sick in this congregation right now. The one other is, I want to say, I already alluded to it. People say, okay, all you have to do is name the, issue, uh, name the illness and name a sin with it, and you'll be healed. To them, all sickness is a result of sin. So what you need to do most is confess your sin. And, the, and, and James says here, all of us have been parts of anointing where we ask, hey, do you have something to confess? And they say, yes, I did something terrible. And I and that will never leave this room, but I want God to forgive me and the other, and the other party so that I may be healed, and that's beautiful. Okay. But, it, but when this is taken to the extreme, uh, it, the message is, if you're not healed, you're dishonest. You haven't been honest with God. <laughs> the problem is, scriptures already have spoken about three kinds of sicknesses that don't apply to name it and claim it healing. The spiritual dis... Uh, Sickness for spiritual discipline, which is the only way God can reach us sometimes. Sickness for our calling home unto God. And sickness that brings glory to God. And the, so the problem with name it and claim it is that there's a lot of guilt, shame, and anger. Because if God is the magic genie and decides not to ante up and do that healing, then you're going to be very angry with God. And all of a sudden, God is serving me. Lord, I want this. Lord, this. I want to, it doesn't matter. I want this healed. I want that. And it will never end. And we're telling God. So we pray a prayer and we get it. God does heal. God does bless. But God is not at my service, is he? <laughs> it is me to get on my knees and worship him and to leave that door and love my neighbor and my enemy as myself. Well, that's a lot of talk about prayer. As a church, we hold the realistic view, the biblical view. God still heals, and he heals unbelievers, but not everybody gets healed. James says we are to call on the spiritual leaders of our fellowship. The sick person is to call them in, and the leaders are to ask them to share confidentially. No one puts on a show, uh, but everyone needs to identify with the local body of leadership and spiritual intercessors. In the Bible, there's no such thing as free-floating Christians. This passage speaks of one more time. You and I need to pray. <clears throat> and that's when you and I are hurting spiritually. We may, be in, we may be in fine health, we may be in decent spirits, but we may be harboring unforgiveness towards others 
That is warranted. <clears throat> Some people hurt us terribly. That's the human journey. And this unforgiveness see, starts to take over our lives. And the only answer is seeking the grace of God enough that we can let it go. You will let it go, and two days later, it'll come back. <laughs> it will come back. And you let it go again until finally it's let go, and I shared a few weeks ago, and, and say, dear Lord, by the way, if that comes back, now I'm going to start praying a sincere blessing that person. And that'll stop. <laughs> uh, that, and, you know, you, you both all know what I mean. <clears throat> the doctors say it's not just what you eat, which is very important, but what's eating at you. If we don't follow God's principles, <clears throat> we will find out in our bodies. One time I was stressed and I looked at my arm and the skin bubbled up. This was as I, uh, in my 30s. I had shingles. Whoa! Uh, I, I didn't know I was stressed, but I was. How do you fix that? You cool your jets. And the world isn't ending, is it? When you think it is. Remember that. If we allow hurts to build, which is human, it can lead us into lives of sin. Remember that. Everything is on a journey. The scriptures beg us to take God seriously and not be anxious about anything, but to pray about everything and to give it over to God. It is an art to learn to say, okay, God, this is my burden, and it's real. I'm giving it to you, and I'm going out for lunch. Now, that sounds funny, but you know what I mean. we got to let so much go. We are called to do our part as best we can, and then to confess the world's problems are really God's problems. So the spiritual life, in conclusion, has two steps. We do our part, what we can. And we actively yield everything over to God and say, I'm neither the creator, nor the savior of the universe, nor even of my immediate family. And our yielding, saying God is yours, truly becomes our healing. May we sing from the fullness of our souls, God of grace and God of glory, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of these days. Number 332. <clears throat> and you may rise.
Dear God, we cherish these few moments we have had together. The singing, the learning, the praying, the enjoying of one another, and the moving of your spirit among us. Now dismiss us to live and love for you in this new week that you have blessed us with. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you.